whenever you want, want to record it. And okay. um, that way, uh, if there's a problem, we've got it recorded multiple places. Got it. Perfect. All right. Well, you, um, you can see that. I can see you and I can see your screen. Okay. All right, so we're gonna get started. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us um, this on this edition of the Educated Horsemen in the Virtual Classroom. We've got Dr. McCauley from the LSU Vet School, and he's gonna talk to us a little bit about equine dental care. Um, good morning. Um, my name's Chuck McCauley. I am actually, uh, I, I jokingly tell people I am not a dentist. I just so happen to be a surgeon that does dentistry. Um, uh, I, when I first got here, um, the Equine Health Studies Program, which I'm a member of, was um, uh, under the direction of a guy named Rustin Moore, and Rusty Moore walked up to me one day and he told me, you're going to develop a dentistry expertise. So um, I, I took that and I ran with it, and um, now I do probably 95% of the dental and sinus surgeries at LSU, and in addition to that, the routine dentistries, for the most part, with the exception of ambulatory, we do have very capable veterinarians that do dentistry here. Um, but um, we've always had a select service that I've done most of the dental care on and, and um, continue that. So what I'm going to talk to everybody about today is kind of my approach to routine dentistry. Um, you can spend days and weeks talking about dental care. I actually give a two-week course to the students and still I'm not able to to um, uh, get all the information even in two weeks time to the students. So trying to do that in an hour or two is, is even more challenging. So I tried to limit it to um, um, dentistry in general. So um, just some of my uh, philosophy on why we should perform dentistry in horses. The first thing we have to understand is the impact that domestication has had on horses. Um, everybody, I always get this question about well, why is it that horses in the wild don't need routine dentistry? And the main thing is, is because they were not domesticated. Even if you look back at horses 100 years ago and you compare the life expectancy of horses 100 years ago to horses today, 100 years ago, horses had jobs. They had to pull plows. Um, they had to pull carts. Um, oftentimes, they were in dangerous situations. And they probably didn't live very long. They didn't live very far into their teen years. Uh, about horses 100 years ago, they didn't, we didn't have routine vaccinations for diseases like West Nile and the encephalitides and rabies. Um, we didn't do routine deworming in horses 100 years ago, and we sure didn't do colic surgeries on horses 100 years ago. So the life expectancy of a horse, even as short as 100 years ago, was probably significantly shorter than what they are today. Today, the healthcare is um, uh, much better in all facets of veterinary medicine. So just like the human population, the equine population is getting older and older and older. And because of that, there are age-related changes that take place in the horse's mouth. And um, those age-related changes um, have a significant impact on the, the function of the mouth. So um, the, the oldest horse that I have actually done surgery on in this hospital was 38 years old. And that horse lived four more years after I operated on it. So the, the impact and the changes that took place in that horse's mouth are, are astounding over time. The drawback to domestication is that we tend to feed horses highly processed grain. More often than not, they're at least partially confined, which means they have minimal exposure to grazing. Um, we also feed them differently than the way that they um, ate in years past. In years past, horses were primarily grazers. So I, I, I do this all the time with the students. What I have people do is I have them put their teeth together and then tilt their head back and then tilt their head forward and pay attention to what happens to your lower jaw in relation to your upper jaw. And what you'll find is that it moves. It slides backwards and forwards depending on your head position. And that same thing happens in horses. So when horses are grazing, their lower jaw moves forward in relation to their upper jaw. And then when they pick their head up, for whatever reason, whether it's to look around to see if uh, a predator's coming on them or if they're just looking for their herd mates, that jaw moves back. And what that causes is more even wear of the teeth. Um, uh, and by feeding them in a trough or an elevated bucket, they tend to eat in the exact same position. So we don't get that even wear. So because of that, we start to get changes. We start to get abnormal wearing of the teeth and the development of things like hooks and ramps. 
Um, also, we decrease their exposure to environmentally abrasive material, which affects the way the horse's teeth wear. So, um, the, the, their, even though there are, their life expectancy is greater because of those things that we do as part of the domestication process, we've profoundly impacted um, the way their teeth wear and the way they're able to chew and masticate. Um, the other thing that's different is the performance expectations of horses. So um, uh, we expect horses, even though most horses are considered companion animals today, we still expect them to pay their way in some ways. The classic barrel horse or open horse or, or even kids horse, um, we have some level of performance expectation. And uh, I hear all the time people talk about how horses have gotten tired of their jobs or they're soured of their jobs. And I don't believe that happens. Um, horses don't have the mental capacity to think to themselves, man, I'm really tired of jumping jumps. I'm just not gonna do it anymore. That just doesn't happen. When a horse is refusing a jump or a horse is not performing up to expectations, it's generally because there's some discomfort there. And one of the primary places that I look whenever I'm presented with a horse that has a decrease in performance is I look in their mouth. The things that take place in their mouth can significantly impact their performance. So when I'm doing dentistry, routine dentistry on horses, I have two primary goals. The first goal is gonna be the elimination of pain. And most people, or many people will say, well, you're missing some goals here. We're, you're not saying anything about um, improving the horse's ability to eat or a, a, a improving the horse's ability to perform. Well, the reason the horses aren't eating well and the reason they're not performing well is because they're generally in pain. And I'll hopefully give you some examples of that as we continue our talk. So I want to eliminate pain in these horses first and foremost. The second thing that I want to do is I want to maintain the function of the tooth as long as I possibly can. Again, we're taking an animal that in years past maybe lived into their early teens that are now living into their late 20s, early 30s, and even into their 40s in some rare occasions. And what happens is, is I had a, a mentor when I was in school named Leon Scrutchfield, and Leon Scrutchfield used to say that old horses didn't die, he ran out of teeth. And Scrutchfield was pretty much right. That is exactly what happens. Their teeth expire, and when their teeth expire, they are unable to eat, and they are unable to gain the nutrition that they're supposed to, and we start having significant problems with them. In addition to that, not only are they not able to eat and uh, obtain the nutrition, but we start having systemic issues associated with horses that are losing teeth. Uh, impactions, which cause colic, uh, are oftentimes because the forage that the horse is taking in is improperly uh, ground. Choke is another major problem because they're unable to grind, grind their teeth. So my second goal for doing dentistry is to maintain the function of, the, of that teeth, uh, of those individual teeth as long as I possibly can. Now, when we talk about teeth, we have to understand a little bit about anatomy of the tooth. So what this picture is demonstrating is the typical anatomy of the horse's teeth. This is the dental formula for the permanent teeth in an adult. This is the dental formula for a foal. So a deciduous tooth is simply a baby tooth. Um, a foal generally is going to be born either with um, three incisors fully erupted or they will erupt their incisors very shortly after birth and they almost always have three deciduous pre, uh, premolars. As they grow, they will lose those deciduous incisors and replace them with three permanent incisors. They will oftentimes um, uh, uh, erupt a canine tooth, and then they can erupt three to four premolar teeth. Now, the reason that it's three to four is because we forget that the first premolar tooth is actually the wolf tooth. And the interesting thing about the wolf tooth is the wolf tooth is the only what we call brachydont tooth in the horse's head. And I'll explain what a brachydont tooth here is in a second. Um, but is the, it is the only brachydont tooth in the horse's head. The rest of the teeth are considered hypsodont. And I'll explain what that means in a minute. Not all horses have um, uh, wolf teeth. If we actually took 100 horses today that were two-year-olds and we examined their mouth, what we would find is probably about 70 of those horses have wolf teeth. If we didn't touch those horses' mouths for a year and we came back and re-examined them, what we would probably find is only about 30 of those horses, the same horses, would have wolf teeth. Because what happens is, is as the other permanent teeth erupt, it puts pressure on the root of that wolf tooth 
that root is resorbed, the tooth becomes loose, and it oftentimes will fall out. So my preference on young horses is actually to wait till they're a little older sometimes to take their wolf teeth out just because they're literally easier to get out. But that's why we have here listed three to four premolar teeth. And then finally, we have three molar teeth. So these are the incisors here. These are, would be the canines. The um, wolf tooth would sit right in front of this first premolar. These teeth are collectively called cheek teeth. So the premolars and the molars together are collectively called cheek teeth. You have three premolar cheek teeth and three molar cheek teeth. Now, one thing that um, uh, I always um, talk to people about is caps. Um, you'll hear the term molar caps. There actually is no such thing as a molar cap. A cap is a shedding deciduous tooth. So it is a baby tooth that is um, being shed and the only teeth that actually develop caps are going to be the premolar teeth and the incisors. And the only reason that these teeth develop caps is because they have what we call deciduous precursors. So as foals, they have uh, baby incisors and baby premolars that they shed, and those uh, baby teeth are replaced by permanent teeth. So that's the source of the caps. So only incisors and only premolars are going to have caps. You're not gonna have molar caps because a molar doesn't have a deciduous precursor. So it doesn't have that baby tooth to shed. Now, I mentioned um, the difference between brachydonts and hypsodonts, and th this is a classification of different types of teeth. So what I have here is I have pictures of both a human's mouth as well as a horse's mouth, a an image of both, and then radiographs of both. We as humans are considered brachydonts. And what that means is, is all of the crown that we're ever gonna have is exposed in our mouth as soon as that tooth erupts. When you look at an X-ray of a human's teeth, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see this very bright white line right here. And what this bright white line is, is it's enamel. Enamel is the most radiant dense material that you're gonna find in the body. So it's not only the hardest material in the body, but it's the most radiant dense. So it's gonna show up as this bright white. Even bone isn't gonna show up as this bright white here. So this is all enamel. And what you can see is there's no enamel extending within the bone. This is actually the bone here. This is called crestal bone, which is the bone that is between each one of the teeth. And then as humans, we have these really well-developed roots that hold the, the tooth in the head. But notice that there's no bright white surrounding these roots. That's because by definition, a root's not gonna have enamel. The enamel is completely exposed in the, in the mouth. A horse, on the other hand, is what's called a hypsodont. So what a hypsodont means is that um, we have these long teeth, or the horse has these long teeth that are capable of continuous eruption. And no, if you look at the x-ray of this horse's teeth, what you'll see is that bright white extends all the way uh, along the entire length of the tooth. So what actually holds a horse's teeth in the bone is the tooth itself. This is all crown. So there is crown that is exposed in the mouth. That's this part of the crown right here. That's called clinical crown. And then there is this crown that is buried in the bone. Crown is called reserve crown. You can think of it as crown that's being held in reserve for that horse to use later. So what happens is, is as this, to, as this horse goes through its life, these teeth are gonna be rubbing on each other. And if you think about this surface right here, this surface right here is where the masseter muscle attaches. And the masseter muscle is a very large muscle in horses, and it is the primary muscle of mastication. <clears throat> it's the primary muscle that the horse chews with. And it's capable of creating a tremendous amount of grinding force. If you think about the horse ingests, they're gonna ingest roughage, and they have to grind that roughage into much smaller particles in order to swallow it and then to utilize it for nutrition. So that grinding is transmitted to the surface of the tooth. So what happens is, is over time, the teeth wear away and then they erupt. So the tooth is capable of continuous, continuous eruption. That's different than continuous growth. These teeth don't grow. Once this permanent tooth erupts, it's not gonna get larger. As a matter of fact, it's gonna get smaller over time because it's gonna be wearing away at the, what's called the occlusal surface. So this is the occlusal surface of the tooth. This tooth is gonna to wear away throughout that horse's lifetime. 
that the wearing is roughly at about two to four millimeters per year. And that's dependent on many factors. It's dependent on how frequently the horse receives dental care. It's dependent on where in the country the horse can be found. That wear is probably accelerated in horses that are in areas like California and Arizona and New Mexico because the material that they're ingesting is more coarse. They're on sandy type soils. They ingest that sand as they're ingesting forage and the sand is very abrasive. So it's gonna accelerate the wear of these teeth. In South Louisiana, we have river silt. So river silt really doesn't have very much abrasive properties. So these teeth will probably last a little bit longer in a horse in South Louisiana than say a horse that's in Arizona. But you can kind of figure out how long this tooth is gonna last just by doing a little simple math. If this tooth is six centimeters long and it's gonna wear at three millimeters per year, what that's gonna tell you is this tooth is actually designed to last for about 20 years. This particular tooth erupts at between three and a half and four years of age. So in a horse that's in its mid twenties, this tooth is gonna to be completely worn away and probably no longer functional as far as um, being able to grind food. This tooth here is the first molar. This tooth erupts at about a year. So probably in this horse's early twenties, we're gonna see loss of this tooth because it's simply gonna grind away. And we can impact based on the way that we perform dentistry, actually how long these teeth are capable of functioning. So that's one of the things that I look at every time that I, I float a horse's teeth. The other important thing about this wearing process is that the, 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 when you look at the anatomy of the horse's jaw, what you will find is the upper jaw, the maxilla, is wider than the lower jaw, the mandible. And what that creates, that plus the, the, the masticatory cycle, the movement of the mouth as the horse chews, actually creates or, or causes the development of sharp enamel points. And we, when we talk about sharp enamel points in horses, there are two primary locations that we see these sharp enamel points. One is called the buccal surface of the tooth. And that's gonna be the outside surface of the upper teeth. So buckle is just another word that represents cheek. So the buccal surface of the tooth is the surface that is on the outside or up against the cheek. On the maxillary arcade or the upper um, teeth, that the sharp enamel points generally are gonna form along this outer edge here. On the lower arcade or the mandibular arcade, usually they form on what's called the lingual surface. So the lingual surface is, lingual is just another word for tongue. So the lingual surface is gonna be the surface of the lower teeth that is up against the tongue. So this prolonged eruption in wear that takes place results in a wear pattern that causes the formation of sharp enamel points. Those sharp enamel points are primarily located on the buccal or outer surface of the upper teeth and the lingual or inner surface of the lower teeth. Now, you, you probably think to yourself, well, if my horse has dental problems, I should see some signs of those dental problems, some outward sign of that dental problem. And that's not always the case. As a matter of fact, more often than not, there's no outward external signs of dental disease until that dental disease progressed. Um, however, if you do see signs, the signs can be quite variable. As I said before, sometimes it's something as um, nondescript as a horse that just isn't performing up to expectations. Sometimes it's a systemic sign. Anytime that I am presented with a horse that colics, I think it is prudent to examine that horse's mouth. Even certain surgical colics can be precipitated by poor dentition. So things like impactions, ileal impactions, uh, cecal impactions, those are are forms of colic that can be directly related to poor dentition. Other clues to dental disease that you might see are weight loss or poor body condition. Now I say weight loss, sometimes it's also the failure to gain weight. So for instance, a broodmare. A broodmare's got a little parasite on their side for about six months. And what's gonna happen is, is while they're lactating and they're supporting that foal, they're gonna lose body condition. Once that foal is weaned, that broodmare should regain her body condition during the gestation period. If she fails to regain that body condition, we probably should think to ourselves that we need to look in that horse's mouth. 
when, when I think of weight loss in a horse, if I'm presented with a horse for weight loss, there are three primary things that we always look at before we start chasing after more sinister things like systemic disease. We always look at number one, is the horse actually receiving enough nutrition to maintain their body weight for whatever their purpose in life is? Number two, we generally are gonna to look to see is that horse parasitized? If that horse is parasitized, they will oftentimes um, lose. Number three, we almost always do a dental exam on those horses. I, I have had horses that have, have had profoundly poor body conditions that had severe dental disease that once we corrected those horses dental conditions, the horses were able to regain their body condition back. Changes in fecal character are also important. And this can go, this can um, extend anywhere from horses that have very long fiber length or excessive fiber length. Generally, if a horse is adequately grinding their feed, they're always gonna pass some fiber through. But I generally tell people that that fiber length should be less than maybe a half a centimeter in length. So a quarter of an inch length fiber is what I would consider to be expected in an average healthy horse. I've seen horses with poor dental disease or poor dental um, conditions where their fiber length may be two to three centimeters, so upwards of an inch and a half long. If I see that in typical feces, I'm going to start asking whether or not that horse um, has some dental conditions. Passing whole grain all the way through the GI tract also shouldn't. We mentioned the master muscle and how much grinding pressure that puts um, on the occlusal surface of the teeth. That, um, that whole grain should be crushed and at least cracked or broken. If they're passing whole grain through, then I'm going to have concerns about that. Um, I've even seen horses that have had diarrhea associated with dental disease as well. So any change in um, fecal consistency can indicate that there's dental disease present. When you're looking at your horse's face, any lumps, bumps, swellings, draining tracks, so something like this is actually an indication of, an, of a dental infection. This is a swelling that's on one side of the horse's face, and you might not be able to see it very well, but there's actually some purulent material that's draining from an opening in this swollen area right here, so that's a draining tract. And when you investigate something like this, generally what you'll find is this is gonna go directly to a tooth, and there's typically issues with the single tooth there. Um, this is a patient that has unilateral nasal discharge. So there's purulent material that's draining out of a single nostril. Um, one thing we didn't mention when we were talking about anatomy, but if we think about those three molar teeth and sometimes the last premolar, the, those teeth are actually embedded in the maxillary sinus. And if there is disease affecting any of those three or four teeth, oftentimes what we will have is we will have a secondary sinusitis or a secondary sinus infection that's directly related to the disease process that's taking place in that tooth. So um, unilateral nasal discharge is a very common sign that's associated with um, a diseased tooth, particularly a diseased maxillary molar or premolar. Um, bad breath is another sign that you will sometimes see in horses that have um, dental disease, particularly older horses. Older horses that develop periodontal disease, the periodontum is the supporting structures of the teeth. So that's the gum, that's the soft tissue structures that hold the tooth in the horse's um, bone, and that's the bone surrounding the tooth itself. So if there's disease processes affecting that, those supporting structures, many times that process is infected, and those horses will have bad breath. That's something that we tend to see in the older population of horses. Um, there's been some studies that have shown that about 60% of horses older than 15 have some degree of periodontal disease that ranges from very mild to very severe, and those horses that are moderate to severely infected will oftentimes have bad breath. That's not what we usually see. Usually what we're going to see is performance issues. So we're going to see the horse that um, has bad habits when it comes to performance, a horse that has a head tilt when the bit's in their mouth, maybe they're tossing their head, refusing their bit, or even refusing to perform what they're trained to perform. I mentioned the horse that is refusing a jump. Many times those horses are going to have some oral pain, and that's usually one of the first places that I look. If I'm presented with a horse that comes in for a performance issue, I'm oftentimes gonna um, uh, look in those horses' mouths first, and if I don't find an abnormality in the horse's mouth, I'm generally gonna look to see if the horse is lame next. 
I, I think back to um, several years ago, a couple of years after I first started here, I was presented with a young colt um, that uh, came in from this old Cajun man that told me when he, when he got the colt six months ago, it was the best colt he ever owned. Now all he does is buck him off. And we opened that horse's mouth and examined his mouth. And what we found was that that horse had caps. And caps, retained caps, actually will have very sharp spicules of enamel on them. And what was happening is, is those little spicules of enamel were lacerating that horse's gum every time he had a horse's bit in his mouth. So that pain caused the horse to react. We went in, we removed those caps, and about three weeks later, that trainer called me and he told me, he said, man, he's back to the greatest horse I ever owned again. So um, it's amazing how oral pain can profoundly affect uh, the horse's ability to train, especially other, not just pain, but just abnormal wear, especially in horses that need to collect. So things like dressage horses or um, hunters that uh, need to collect, they need to round their pole, round their necks, round their rear ends. If they have abnormal dental overgrowth or abnormal wear, because of their inability for their jaw to move backwards and forwards, like I described before, what they oftentimes will do is open their mouth, grab their bit, and extend their head and neck, and that's perceived as a training issue, when in actuality, the horse wants to do what you're asking of him, but they are incapable of doing what you're asking of them because there's some obstruction from abnormal dental wear or abnormal dental overgrowth. So I, I would tell you, just because your horse isn't performing up to expectation, it might not be because he's hard-headed or, uh, uh, or bad or doesn't want to. It's probably because he either can't or because there's some pain, some painful stimuli somewhere. Right. So, Dr. McCauley, for those of our um, listeners that don't quite understand the, how the mechanics of collection, just a quick um, explanation. Really, mm -hmm. for a horse to collect, you want him to engage his low, he wants to engage his back, round his back drive his hindquarters up underneath him, but you also want him to drop at the pole. And for that to happen, a horse has to drop his nose and his lower jaw has to slide forward for him to drop the pole correctly. So if he has, like Dr. McCauley was explaining, if he has some type of issue with his teeth, if he's got hooks and ramps that reduce his ability to drop that lower jaw forward, he's not going to be able to collect properly. That, that's exactly right. That is precisely right. As a matter of fact, there are some um, rudimentary tests that we do whenever we do an oral exam on a horse to determine whether or not they're actually able to move that jaw forward and backwards the way they're supposed to. The simplest way to envision this, and I don't know if anybody will be able to see my face, but if you put your jaw together, put your teeth together, and tilt your head as far back as you can, and then tilt your head as far forward as you can, what you'll find is your mandible, your, your lower jaw, as you tilt back, your mandible will slide backwards. As you tilt forward, your mandible will slide forward. And if you have hooks and ramps are a perfect example of that, and I actually have some images of those that I'll show in a minute. If you have hooks and ramps, it prevents that mandible from sliding forward and backward the way it's supposed to. It locks the jaw in place. So even the horse may know that that's what they're supposed to do, and even though they may want to do it, they're unable to do it because those hooks and ramps are literally locking the jaw in place. When you have those types of situations, you will oftentimes see changes in the way the horses eat as well. One common thing is very slow, deliberate chewing and posturing when they chew. Sometimes these are so bad that the horse actually has to put their head in a specific position in order to adequately grind their feet effectively. So you'll see that horse will extend his head and neck while he's actually eating simply to be able to get his molar teeth together so that they can grind their teeth effectively. They'll have exaggerated tongue movement, exaggerated movement of their head, and then many horses that have oral pain will do what's called quitting. So if you walk in your stall one day and you find little wads of hay that are soaked with saliva that look like this on the ground, that's a horse that's quitting. So what they're doing is they're chewing on their hay, but then they're spitting it out. They're soaking it with saliva and they're spitting it out. The other thing that you'll sometimes see is you'll start noticing that your horse starts to look like a chipmunk every now and then. And instead of spitting these wads of hay out, what they're actually doing is they're packing them in their cheeks and they're actually trying to protect their cheeks from pain that's associated with abnormal overgrowth in the oral cavity. And I'll show you some examples of that, and why they'll do that and try to point that out as we go through. So many times you will find that the, um, the signs of dental disease can be quite subtle 
They are oftentimes associated with performance and eating as opposed to outward signs like weight loss or draining tracts or those types of things. It's generally when they're more severe that we start seeing those types of signs. The subtle signs are the performance limit limitations and the eating habits that um, can oftentimes be overlooked because what we do is at seven o'clock in the morning, we got to get to work. We dump the feed in the bucket. We throw the hay in the hay rack and we head off to work and we don't actually watch and see how the horses are eating and if they're actually able to eat effectively. Um, so the first thing that I'm always going to do um, whenever I'm presented with a horse with, for dental disease is I'm going to do a good quality dental exam. And uh, I, I, the examination process for me actually starts when the horse gets off the trailer. So the first thing I'm going to look at is obviously the horse's body condition. I want to know what kind of body condition is the horse in. And then the other thing that I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at the horse's head. The horse's head should be very symmetrical. So it's a mirror image. The right side should look essentially exactly the same as the left side does. So one of the things that we look at, <coughs> excuse me, is we look at the muscles of mastication. So we look at what are called the masseter muscles and we look at the temporal muscles on the horse. And we want to make sure that they're the same on each side. Again, we look for lumps and bumps and draining tracks and those types of things. But the muscles of mastication are, are one of the primary things that I look at. Um, for me, I'm fortunate in that I have a stock that I work in and I have lots of help. Um, a ambulatory veterinarian, that is oftentimes a lot different. Many times they're working in the stall, usually in the stall uh, door, and they have some type of apparatus to suspend the horse's head from the stall door. Um, I have some very strong feelings about the way a dental examination should be done. I teach dentistry to veterinary students. I've been doing dentistry for my entire 25 year career. Um, and um, the dental exam is every bit as important as actually floating the horse's teeth. And there are some necessary equipment that all veterinarians should use to do a good quality dental exam. And I bring this up because if you have a veterinarian or if you are looking for a veterinarian, I would ask whether or not they use this equipment and I would choose veterinarians based on their use of, the equi uh, of this equipment. So what I have a picture of right here is a full mouth speculum. And there are a variety of different types of full mouth speculums. This one just so happens to be what's called a McPherson speculum. The way a speculum works is it has these little plates on it right here. And these little plates are where the incisors rest. And then most of them have some sort of a ratchet system, which is right here. So this ratchet system actually allows this little um, um, joint here or hinge here to open and to lock the jaw in an open position, which is what's being demonstrated right here. So this full mouth speculum allows the horse's mouth to be opened and held in an open position. In my opinion, and this is the world according to Macaulay, I think it is bordering on malpractice to do an oral examination without a full mouth speculum. And the reason is, is because there is no possible way that you can get to the molar teeth on a horse without the jaw being held open. In addition to that, you cannot adequately examine with your fingers or by, by looking into the horse's mouth without a full mouth speculum. There is no possible way that you can get your fingers back to the back of this horse's mouth to the very last tooth without that horse's mouth being fixed in an open position. So in my opinion, if somebody is doing an oral exam without the use of a um, speculum, they are not doing a complete oral exam. And I, I think if you ever want proof of this, <laughs> We teach a dental course to the veterinary students in the fall or in the spring, early spring, where we use herd horses at LSU. And those herd horses are generally donated. And a large percentage of those herd horses will come from the racetracks for a variety of different reasons. When we first get those horses in, what you will oftentimes find is the premolar teeth. So the teeth that are closest to the opening of the oral cavity here are oftentimes very well floated. They're very nicely done. Um, they don't have any sharp enamel points. They don't have any hooks or ramps on them. But when you get to the molar teeth, more often than not, what you will find is there are very large hooks, very large ramps, very large sharp enamel points, and a lot of soft tissue damage 
in the back of that horse's mouth. And the reason is, is because somebody is floating that horse's mouth, frankly, without a full mouth speculum. And it, it proves to me that you are unable to either examine or float the molar teeth without a full mouth speculum. So as an individual, as an individual horse owner, I would choose my veterinarian. One of the, one of the uh, criteria I would use for choosing a veterinarian is whether or not they use the full mouth speculum to do a dentistry. In addition to a full mouth speculum, you really need a good light source. Um, the back of this is like a cave. The back of this mouth is like a cave. You need to project light to the back of the mouth, again, in order to um, uh, examine it effectively. And I almost always use a dental mirror to examine <clears throat> the, the uh, back of the mouth as well. This is a horse that's demonstrating what's called a diastema, which is an abnormal space between two teeth. And this tooth right here is abnormally positioned in the jaw, which is why it has a diastema. And this horse is packing food between these two teeth. And that food packing can actually have some negative effects on the periodontum uh, and cause periodontal disease. And you simply cannot see this without the use of either a, um, a mirror or a dental speculum. A mirror is plenty adequate, or excuse me, not a dental speculum, um, a dental endoscope. A mirror is very adequate. I'm fortunate to have a dental endoscope, but a mirror is adequate in a um, well-trained and experienced veterinarian's hands. Um, dental picks and cheek retractors, um, I have them listed under necessary equipment. I don't know that they're absolutely necessary. I think they're very useful in doing a dental exam, but the full mouth speculum, a good light source, and a dental mirror, in my opinion, are instrumental in doing a dental exam on horses. And I, 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 if he, I would encourage you to choose your veterinarian and one, uh, based on their use of a full mouth speculum. If they tell you that, that um, um, they don't use a full mouth speculum, it's probably okay to use them to do things like Coggins tests or routine things, suturing up lacerations, but I would find somebody else to do your dental care in those cases. Um, the intraoral examination, when, when we think of a dental examination, probably everybody's minds go directly to examination of the teeth, and we do have to examine the teeth, but more often than not, what becomes very important to us is soft tissue trauma. This is a horse, again, that has a full mouth speculum in. This is a cheek retractor here, and there's a light shining back here. And what that gives you the ability to do is to examine the back of the mouth. And what you will find in many of these horses is significant soft tissue trauma. So you can see this area right here. This is where the cheek has been severely lacerated. And those lacerations are coming from these sharp enamel points here that we mentioned before. Remember. A few slides back, I talked about how that wear, that, that continuous eruption throughout the horse's life and continuous wear throughout the horse's life causes the formation of sharp enamel points. And these sharp enamel points, um, because the cheek is an intimate association with the buccal surface of the tooth, so this is a buccal surface of the tooth, that cheek is in intimate association with the buccal surface of the tooth, those sharp points literally lacerate the inside of the, of the gum here. And that, that generates a significant amount of pain for many of these horses. In addition to that, other things that we'll oftentimes find, it is, is, it is very common for horses to have fractures of individual teeth. So this is an example of the first molar of a tooth that's actually fractured and split in half. And then this portion of the fracture fragment is actually being pushed into the mouth and every time this horse closes its mouth, this fracture fragment is rubbing and irritating the tongue. So not only is this horse having pain associated with the fracture itself, but then you're compounding that pain by irritation on the horse's tongue. And if we could see this horse's tongue, what we would probably find is there's probably a large ulcer on that horse's tongue in that specific area right there. So this is, this is a fracture. And again, I go back to this idea of a full mouth speculum. Without a full mouth speculum, this is easy to miss. Without a full mouth speculum, it's almost impossible to see this. This is an example of a hook or a ramp. I tend to use those, those um, terms interchangeably. By definition, a ramp actually involves about greater than 25% of the surface of the individual tooth, whereas a hook is less than 25% of the, individual, the, the total surface of the individual tooth. It's really an academic distinction. 
they, they cause the same problems. We talked about the inability of the mandible to move in relation to the maxilla with a change in head position. If I have this large hook here, this horse is gonna be unable to move the mandible forward in relation to the maxilla. This is the maxilla here. And if you ask this horse to collect, so you ask this horse to round his pole and to round his neck and to round his back, he's simply gonna be unable to do it. And in order to even attempt to do it, what he's gonna do is he's gonna open his mouth and the bit's gonna slide back between his teeth. And people are gonna perceive that as a training issue. So all these things are very important to us when we're doing an oral exam. We, not, we don't just look at the horse's teeth, but we look at the soft tissues, the tongue, the cheeks themselves, and then literally palpating, so putting your fingers on each one of the horse's teeth and looking at each one of the horse's teeth with a mirror so that you can identify these additional problems. I, when I was in private practice several years ago, a friend of mine in East Texas had back surgery and he had a mixed animal practice and, a, and asked me to come in and um, do some relief work on the large animal side of his mixed animal practice. And I could not sell a $40 float in that practice. And floats are a lot more expensive for us. Um, but a $40 float is dirt cheap. I could not get people to uh, appreciate and understand the need for floating horses teeth. And I, I, I got an idea one day and I offered to a client that I would pay for the sedation and exam if he would let me examine the horse's mouth. And what I did was I opened the horse's mouth and I allowed that client to feel just how sharp these sharp enamel points are. And as soon as I did that, word spread like wildfire and I was floating teeth every day because that client finally appreciated how damaging these sharp enamel points can be to the inside of the mouth. And I do that with clients still today. If they don't understand why, or even if they're just curious, I let them feel those sharp enamel points. And these points can be razor sharp in many instances. So the dental exam is incredibly important. Now, once we have done the dental exam, there is some routine procedures that we will do on most horses that come in. You will see many practices that advertise a performance float. And uh, I, I, I think that's um, um, just kind of how they advertise their floats rather than calling a dental float. They call it a performance float and they kind of package this group of things together. Um, at LSU, we actually charge separately for each one of these things, but um, um, the, the, charge, the charges actually come out to be about the same depending on where you go. The average cost of a dental equilibration, which is actually the floating process for us, is about $110. And then we add um, sedation to that. And that's pretty equivalent to most places in the country. Um, if you think about floating, why is it called dental floating? Well, there are several other things that we float in life. We float drywall, we float concrete. That simply means leveling. So dental equilibration, dental floating, dental leveling, they all mean the same thing. But what we're really trying to do with uh, floating horse's teeth is we're trying to remove those sharp enamel points that I uh, demonstrated to you earlier. Um, as part of the float, we'll typically reduce any hooks and ramps that are there, and I'm going to talk about that individually. We will reduce canines. Not all horses will have canines, but I will show you some examples of canines and talk about why we reduce the canines in horses. I'm going to talk briefly about bit seating, and I'm going to talk briefly about what I call incisor leveling. Now, I'm going to put these at the end, and the reason that I'm gonna put them in the end is because those two things are very controversial when it comes to dentistry. You'll hear a wide variety of opinions about whether or not we should be bit seating, how we should be bit seating, and whether or not we should be leveling incisors and how to correctly level incisors. Um, I, 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 I like this quote. The reason that I like this quote is not because uh, I'm a dentist, but because of actually, it demonstrates actually how long these same principles have been applied to equine, to equine healthcare. This, this uh, quote comes directly out of a textbook from the early 1900s. Um, so, uh, and, and it's still true today. This is still principally what we do when we do dentistry is we wanna uh, remove those sharp enamel points that cause pain, that cause, uh, um, difficulty with eating that cause performance inhibitions. 
Uh, and the other thing, again, that we're trying to do is we're trying to remove any dental overgrowth or dental abnormalities so that we, we can maintain the function of those teeth as long as we possibly can. So let's talk about the actual floating process itself. So again, when I look in a horse's mouth, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking to see, does that horse have sharp enamel points? This, again, is the buccal surface. This is the lingual surface. So this is the maxillary arcade or the upper arcade. This is the mandibular arcade here or the lower arcade. And as I mentioned before, you can't appreciate just how bad these sharp enamel points are um, until you actually palpate them or feel them with your own fingers. So <clears throat> I use palpation as a guide to help me determine when I have adequately floated that horse's teeth. Now, where do the sharp enamel points come from and why do they form? Um, this is a cadaveric specimen or a skull of a horse. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the buccal surface of the maxillary arcade or the upper teeth. And what you see here is each one of these teeth have these vertically oriented enamel columns. These enamel columns are called cingulae. So the cingulae, we don't know what the function of the cingulae actually is. If you completely remove the cingulae, it doesn't affect the function of the tooth in any way. The horse can still chew properly. It doesn't predispose them to fracturing the teeth. We don't know what the function of these enamel columns are. The other thing that we do know, however, is that the, these cingulae are not part of the occlusal surface of the tooth. So the occlusal surface of the tooth is this surface right here. It's the working surface of the tooth. The occlusal surface of the maxillary cheek teeth is in contact with the occlusal surface of the mandibular cheek teeth, and that's where all the grinding actually takes place. These um, cingulae are not part of the occlusal surface, of the cheek tooth. So what happens is, is we've, we've talked ad nauseum about how the teeth continuously erupt and continuously wear. It's the occlusal surface that's wearing away. That means the cingulae is not wearing away, so it becomes very much like a knife on a sharpening stone. So those cingulae get sharpened to a very fine point. And one thing that's interesting about the cingulae is they're not the same for every, every horse. The cingulae can be highly variable not only between horses, but also within the same horse. So if we look at this specimen right here, these are very, very prominent cingulae. What we find is, is some horses have very prominent cingulae like these, some horses have very discrete cingulae. Or, or, and, and the difference is, is horses with more prominent cingulae tend to have more prominent sharp enamel points and more prominent sharp enamel points tend to lead to, to greater soft tissue trauma and more pain. So there's a wide variety of differences or a wide uh, range of differences between horses, but also within the same horse. So the cingulae tend to be most prominent on these back two molars right here. And that becomes important because the, the jaw opens like a hinge. It only hinges at one point. The skin is very loose at the front of the mouth, very tight at the back of the mouth. So if I have a combination of large cingulae back here, plus skin that makes this a very tight, narrow space, I tend to have a lot more soft tissue trauma back here adjacent to these last two teeth than say what I'm gonna have up here at these front two teeth. <clears throat> we also tend to have very large prominent cingulae on this second premolar right here and they tend to be less prominent in the central portion of the mouth. That's not always the case. But generally, the most prominent cingulae are gonna be back here on these back two teeth. That's gonna cause us to have the most prominent sharp enamel points and the most severe soft tissue trauma and the most pain. This is where those horses start packing food in their mouth. When your horse starts to look like a chipmunk, what they're doing is they're packing food between their cheek and between this tooth and what they're doing is they're trying to protect their gums and to de decrease the amount of pain that they're having back here. Now, this is another cadaveric specimen. This is looking at the mandible or the lower arcade. And what you will notice here is you will notice these are these, there are these raised areas of enamel right here. These are called cusps. And in many instances, we'll have two cusps side by side that form a ridge. And this is called a transverse ridge. There are areas of the ridge that do not wear away, 
And um, we just consider these non-worn areas of the transverse ridge, and they will also form sharp enamel points. So the sharp enamel points come from unworn portions of the transverse ridge on the lower cheek teeth as opposed to the cingulate on the uppers. These tend to be much less severe and cause much less trauma in the horse's mouth. Um, we do, however, look at the tongue because the tongue is in close opposition to these transverse ridges. And sometimes you will see ulcerations along the tongue when you have very prominent transverse ridges, particularly on horses that haven't had their teeth floating in a long time. Now, <clears throat> the process of floating teeth is very operator dependent. And what I have found, um, especially being an academic practice when I talk to people, is we tend to have two camps of veterinarians or two camps of um, uh, dentists. One camp is absolutely horribly against power equipment and they will tell you that the only way to float a horse's teeth is using hand floats. And this is an example of a set of hand floats. And what you will find on these hand floats is there are a variety of different lengths of floats and a variety of different shapes of floats. And what that does is it gives these hand floats the ability to be used in different parts of the mouth. Each one of these floats has a blade. The blade is replaceable and resharpenable. And there are different coarsenesses of blades, anything from what's considered a super fine blade to a coarse blade. <clears throat> so this gives you a lot of latitude in your ability to work in different areas of the mouth. The problem with hand floating is it's a very physically demanding process and it takes a lot of time to, to hand float. So if you've got six or eight or 10 horses lined up to float in a day, you're gonna be exhausted by the end of the day if you're, doing, if you're using hand floats and your day is gonna be quite long. On the other hand, you'll see a camp that uses only power equipment. There are a variety of different types of power equipment. There are air-driven reciprocating floats where the float blade moves back and forth. There are these classic power float type devices which have basically a drill attached to a shaft that has a gear or a belt in it. That gear or belt turns a rotating blade at the end of the shaft and the rotating blade is what removes the excessive dental material. And then some practitioners will use a Dremel type device. So this Dremel here has a rotating blade on the end of them. And there are different lengths of shafts here that are oftentimes interchangeable that allow you to get to any part of the mouth. And there are people that'll say you should only use power floats. It's not cost effective to use hand floats in any way. It's too slow to use hand floats. Truth be told, they're both wrong. A good veterinarian, a good dentist is gonna have a mix of both types of equipment, some hand floats as well as some power floats. The power float allows you to be very efficient in, in doing the float, but the problem with the float is, is many times these, um, these heads on these power floats are unable to get into very tight spaces. So if you have a horse that has larger hooks or ramps on their molars, many times these floats are too big to get between uh, to get between the opposing tooth and the hook or the ramp, in which case you're going to have to use some type of a hand um, uh, float. So most most good practitioners are going to have a wide variety of equipment that they can choose from in order to do a very good job when it comes to floating teeth. Now, when we are floating the horse's teeth, what my goal is here is to actually remove as much of the cingulate as I possibly can. So I'm gonna skip back a couple of slides to look at this cingulate. Remember we said that the cingulate is the source of the sharp enamel point for the maxillary arcade. It's also the source of the most prominent sharp enamel points. If I combine that with the knowledge that the tooth erupts and wears continuously throughout the horse's life, if I remove a small portion of cingulate, maybe two or three millimeters, what's gonna happen is, is within about six to 12 months, those sharp enamel points are gonna reform and the, um, the, uh, the pain is gonna recur again. But if I come in here and I remove the majority of the cingulate that is exposed in the horse's mouth, I'm gonna prolong the time between floats that it takes for these sharp enamel points to reform. 
So my goal when it comes to floating the upper cheek teeth is to get in here and to remove as much of that cingulate as I possibly can. So this is an example. This is a different horse, unfortunately. But what we've done here is we've completely removed the cingulate all the way back to the gum. So if this tooth is a centimeter, let's say for argument's sake, and I've removed a centimeter of cingulate and this tooth erupts at two to three millimeters per year, it may be as long as three years before those sharp enamel points reform. Now that doesn't mean we don't examine the horse at some set interval. That just means that I'm gonna optimize this horse's performance, not only that for an extended period of time, not only that, it may take me an hour to work on this mouth the first time, but when I see this horse again in six months or a year, I may only spend 20 minutes in that horse's mouth. So it's gonna make me a lot more efficient by removing as much of that cingulate as I possibly can. And um, uh, it's gonna optimize the, the horse's performance for as long as I possibly can by doing it that way. So that's always my goal, is not just to take the sharp enamel points off, but to actually remove the entire cingulate if at all possible. And again, when we do that, it doesn't affect the function of the tooth. It doesn't uh, um, uh, uh, predispose the, the tooth to trauma. It doesn't predispose the horse to, to tooth to fracture. Um, it actually um, improves the horse's performance over time. Now, on the lower, the mandibular arcade, because they don't have cingulate, we don't have the same ability. So what we do in that case, when we float this horse's teeth, is what we're trying to do is we're trying to round the edge of the tooth. So I think I look at my finger and I look at my finger from the side and what I'm trying to mimic by floating that horse's teeth is I want that tooth to look just like the end of my finger. I want it to be smoothly rounded from top to bottom. So I'm gonna try to smoothly round this tooth from the gum to the occlusal surface. Now, one important point is the occlusal surface itself. The occlusal surface of the teeth is rough and irregular. And it's rough and irregular for a, for a reason. Remember, we talked about the transverse ridges. Those ridges and those irregularities and those rough areas in the tooth are very important because what they do is they increase the surface area of the tooth. And by increasing the surface area of the tooth, I actually, or, or the tooth actually increases its efficiency at its job, which is grinding. So you don't want to have somebody come in here and cue ball this off and make it perfectly smooth. That's actually one of the worst things you can do because not only does it decrease the grinding efficiency of the tooth, but it actually accelerates the wear. If I take all those ridges off, I remove two or three millimeters of the tooth. And if I do that multiple times throughout that horse's lifetime, I may decrease the function or decrease the functional life expectancy of the tooth two or three years. So rather than lasting until the horse is 21 or 22, maybe it only lasts until the horse is 18 or 19. And that, that goes against what my original goal is, which is to maintain the function of the horse's tooth as long as I can. All I wanna do is smoothly round the lingual surface of the tooth. This is the tongue, this is the lingual surface. I wanna smoothly round that lingual surface without disrupting those ridges and those raised areas of the tooth. And we can do that using any of the instruments that I described before, whether it's a hand float or a power float. If they're used appropriately with a full mouth speculum, we can make this horse's uh, uh, dentition much better. We can significantly decrease the amount of pain that they have. We can sig significantly improve the way the horse eats. and We can significantly improve the way the horse performs because we've eliminated pain. And that's exactly what our goal is. Now, a couple of other things that we want to think about while we're floating the horse's teeth and other things that I'm going to do while I'm floating that horse's teeth is I'm going to remove any hooks or ramps. So these are examples of what we call premolar hooks. Um, these are vertically oriented overgrowths. So what is happening here is this portion of the tooth is not wearing away. And the reason that it's not wearing away is because we have what's called a malocclusion. So if we have correct occlusion, every tooth on the mandible and maxilla is directly in alignment. 
when we have malocclusion, we do not have the alignment there. The most common reason for malocclusions is actually going back to this idea of domestication. Before horses were domesticated, they grazed. They had their head down, they were chewing with their head down, and then they thought to themselves, I wonder if that panther's sneaking up on me. And they pick their head up, and they look to the right, and they look to the left, and they were chewing the whole time. And every time they raised and lowered their head, their mandible and maxilla were moving in relation to one another. And that allows that, that arcade to wear evenly. When I feed a horse in a bucket that's waist high, that, that mandible and maxilla isn't aligned properly and we get portions of the tooth that don't wear away and we get the formation of these hooks and ramps. And these are premolar hooks. Um, um, and I, I have clients tell me, oh, well, you know, this horse right here, we had his teeth floated last year. Well, if you had his teeth floated last year, this hook wouldn't be this big because the hook grows at the same rate as the tooth erupts. So two to three millimeters, this is obviously a lot larger than two or three millimeters. This hook was about a centimeter. So clearly either the dentist missed it or the teeth weren't actually floated. And these hooks and ramps can, can create significant abnormalities in the horse's ability to chew, they put abnormal force on the opposing or surrounding teeth. They can cause soft tissue trauma. And we talk about the TMJ joint all the time. Everybody talks about TMJ pain in horses. One of the primary reasons that um, horses develop TMJ pain is anything that stops that normal movement of the mandible and the maxilla. So if I have a large hook, a large ramp, that's gonna potentially cause TMJ pain in a horse. And the other thing this is gonna do is it's gonna cause the incisors to be malaligned and it's gonna cause the incisors to actually wear abnormally as well. So hooks are relatively easy to reduce. The same equipment that we use to float the horse's teeth are the, is the exact same equipment that we would use to reduce a hook or a ramp. And what we try to do is we try to reduce that hook or ramp back to the level of the, uh, the tooth itself. The problem is, is the tooth has what's called a pulp horn. And the pulp horn, there are multiple pulp horns in each tooth. The pulp horn contains the artery, vein, and nerve that supplies the tooth. If we inadvertently open the pulp horn by removing too much tooth material, what we do is we cause that tooth to be infected. And the, the premolars and molar teeth of a horse, unlike ours, cannot be, uh, we can't perform um, endodontic pr uh, procedures on them. So we can't do things like root canals like we would do if we had an open pulp horn. So what ends up happening if the, is that if that tooth gets infected is we end up having to remove the tooth, which has other complications associated with it. So to prevent or to minimize the chances of, of opening a pulp horn, we do what's called staged reduction. So if we go back to this tooth right here, I tell clients all the time, this doesn't happen overnight. So that means I can't fix it overnight. So generally what I can do is I can remove a portion of this, say a, a, a half of a centimeter, so a quarter of an inch. And then what I'm gonna do is have the horse come back in three to four months and I'm gonna remove another quarter of an inch. And then three to four months later, I'm gonna remove another quarter of an inch until I get that hook reduced all the way down to the level of the tooth. And this is what it's gonna look like once I've reduced that hook completely. So this horse actually, this, ho this horse is actually this horse. So this is the same horse here with a large hook. This is the horse after we've re reduced the horse. Now we freed up this horse's ability to have his mandible move in relation to his maxilla by removing that hook. The other thing that we'll see is we'll see these molar ramps. So that's what we have here. And these molar wrap, ramps are, first off, they're difficult to diagnose. And the reason they're difficult to diagnose is because they're way in the back of the mouth. Again, if you don't use a full mouth speculum, you're never going to diagnose these. These can get very large. They have the exact same impact as a premolar hook does. So this is going to prevent the mandible from moving freely in relation to the maxilla. But not only that, see this right here? This is a giant laceration. And I'm not gonna use the words to this, that the client used to describe this horse's behavior when she was ridden, 
but we identified why she had that behavior because every time this horse closed its mouth, this giant ramp here buried itself into the horse's palate and created this tremendous laceration here. Once we removed that ramp, we completely changed this horse's behavior because we took away that painful stimuli. Now, one thing I will caution you about is this, these ramps, I said they were difficult to diagnose. They're difficult to diagnose partly because it's difficult to access them, but they can be difficult to diagnose also because there's high breed variability. Sometimes this looks like a ramp, but it's not a ramp. And the reason it's not a ramp is because sometimes the shape of the horse's head causes the tooth to follow the angle of the mandible. And when that happens, we'll actually be directly looking at the occlusal surface of the tooth, but this isn't a dental overgrowth. Sometimes it's just the position of the horse's tooth in relation to the mandible itself. We see that in horses like Arabs, horses that have little compact heads, short mandibles, there, there's not the same amount of room in the mandible as there would be, say, in a thoroughbred that has a really long mandible. In a thoroughbred, if you see this in a thoroughbred, it's probably abnormal because there's plenty of room for all these teeth in a thoroughbred mandible. And in an Arab's mandible, which is significantly shorter, sometimes these teeth are simply following the curve. So a veterinarian needs to get their hand back here. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna measure the distance from the gum to the surface of the tooth, both here as well as here. If the distance is the same, you don't come back in here and try to take this off because you're gonna damage the tooth. If the distance is greater at this aspect of the tooth than this aspect of the tooth, then you have a ramp. You can't do that unless you have a full mouth speculum. So this goes back to that idea that your dentist should be using a full mouth speculum in order to completely and adequately uh, examine this horse's mouth. Also, I talked about how a, a good practitioner is gonna have a variety of different equipment. With this size ramp back here, it's gonna be very difficult to get a power float back here to remove any abnormal dental material. So what you're probably gonna to have to do is get back here with a hand float until you've removed enough of this tooth that you can actually get your power float back there and work. So having a wide variety of different types of dental equipment is very important to managing these situations. And again, this is very much a situation that's gonna require stage reduction. These things can oftentimes be huge and they will frequently take upwards of a year in order to reduce them to the point where they are um, not interfering with that normal movement of the mandible and the maxilla. We think back to this idea of TMJ pain. The more I get this down, the faster I get this down, the faster I'm gonna resolve the TMJ pain in that particular horse as well. But it can take an extended period of time, sometimes six to 12 months to get that done, okay? Um, another part of a routine dental that I'm gonna do in horses is I'm gonna, I'm gonna, do, uh, I'm gonna reduce their canines. The canine teeth usually erupt between four and six years of age. They're present in almost all stallions. They're present in about a quarter to a third of mares. And geldings, we don't have any idea. They're present in some geldings. They're pre not present in others. We don't know exactly why. One thing that I think I would like for you to notice here is notice that the canines, this is normal. They are not in occlusion with each other. And that's very important because one of the common things that happens with canines is oftentimes they will accumulate a significant amount of tartar around them. And the reason they accumulate the tartar is because there is no occlusion. If you look at all the rest of the teeth in the horse's head, they generally don't accumulate tartar. And the reason is, is it goes back to that grinding pressure. The grinding pressure when the horse chews is so great, it actually fractures the tartar off of the tooth and it never has the ability to accumulate. But because these teeth are not in occlusion, sometimes we will accumulate excessive amounts of tartar around those teeth. And what will happen is, is that tartar causes some pretty severe irritation to the gingiva and the horse will uh, develop uh, periodontal disease of its canine teeth. There are several reasons for reducing the canine teeth. For me, the most important thing is this last one right here. I'm a surgeon, not a dentist, so I need my hands. So if I put my hand in a horse's mouth that have these long spear-shaped um, 
canines, this is the first thing that I'm going to reduce. I'm going to take those canines away because they can actually injure the, the person working in the horse's mouth. In stallions, these are modified fighting teeth. This is a weapon. And some stallions use them very effectively. So I'm going to keep them reduced in a stallion so that I disarm that stallion. Um, it prevents the tongue from being damaged, either by being entrapped between the uh, bit and the canine, or from the canine just simply rubbing an ulcer on the tongue. And I don't know about any of y'all, but there have been times that I've been putting a bit in the horse's mouth and smack the bit off of a canine tooth. And those, those horses do not like that. That's very painful to the, to the, to the horse. So I re routinely reduce canines in horses in order to uh, eliminate those problems. Now, there is some debate over how much canine should be removed. Generally, if we're gonna remove them, we're gonna use some sort of a rasp. The good thing about canines is they stop erupting at about 12 to 13 years of age. I continue to reduce them until I get them level with the gingiva. And once they're level with the gingiva, you don't have to mess with them after, the, after they stop reducing or after they stop um, uh, erupting. One thing that I would tell you to avoid is what's called crown amputation. So some people will come in here with a nipper or some type of a cutting device and they will actually cut these canines off. And when that happens, it can cause the canine to fracture longitudinally. And when it fractures longitudinally, the tooth is gonna get infected. This canine has a long curved root that extends back into the jaw and you do not want to have to surgically remove these. In order to surgically remove these, you have to make a great big giant window into the jaw, burr the bone away, and then dig the canine out, and that is not for the faint at heart. So I, I would tell you um, that uh, practitioners, and I, I preach to practitioners to be um, uh, conservative in how much canine that you remove because you can continue to remove that canine throughout the horse's life and once they get to be about 12 years of age, this tooth is gonna to stop erupting and you're gonna be able to eventually reduce it all the way back to the gingiva. So I typically tell people two to three millimeters. So on a tooth like this, I would probably remove it to here. To me, what's more important is that I round it. I make that, that canine nice and smooth and round. And the other thing that happens when I'm reducing this canine is I'm actually knocking the tartar off. I preach to my students all the time, if you leave the tartar, on that canine tooth, it makes the job look unfinished um, and it has potential consequences to it. So I make sure to remove the, can remove the tartar when I'm reducing the canine at the same time. <clears throat> now, uh, I wanna talk about bit seeding. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about bit seeding, um, but bit seeding can be very, very controversial. So what bit seeding is, is it is rounding the front upper and lower second premolar. So this first cheek tooth here. So what we do when we bit seat is we round them. So these are two examples of bit seating. What makes bit seating controversial is A, does it need to be done at all? We try to use what's called evidence-based medicine. And what evidence-based medicine is, is you test a theory and if the theory works, you employ the technique. So a drug, for instance, we test a drug to see if it treats a specific condition. If it treats the condition effectively, we employ the drug, that's evidence-based, we test it. If it doesn't treat the, the, the uh, disease effectively, then we don't use it. When we, uh, when we employ evidence-based medicine to bit seeding, there is no scientific study that clearly proves that bit seeding has any benefit whatsoever in the horse. There's actually only one quasi-scientific study and involved about 700 horses in Australia. And the problem was the study was very poorly done. They didn't have controls, so they didn't have patients that they didn't bit seat that were similar to the patients that they did. Um, and then compared their performance. Um, it was random how they bit seated the horses. Um, so their conclusions were not very good, okay? So there's no evidence that suggests that bit seating works. There is anecdotal evidence that suggests that it does. And what that means is, is there's a bunch of stories out there that, say, that people say, well, I bit seat my horse and he performs a lot better 
when he has a bit seat versus when he doesn't have a bit seat. That may be true. So the way that I approach bit seating when I do dentistry in horses, I don't routinely unless A, the client asks for it. The client says, I want you to bit seat my horse. I'm going to bit seat the horse. And the reason is because the client has the perception that the horse performs better with a bit. Never refuse a horse if a client asks me to. Number two, I'm going to bit seat a horse if he already has a bit seat when I see him. I'm going to go ahead and repeat that. Because if the, horse is, if the horse's performance drops off after I float his teeth, maybe the horse is lame. But the client might say, hey, you didn't bit seat my horse's teeth, therefore they're not performing up to my expectations when he had been performing to my expectations when he was bit seat before. So I don't ever want to get in that position. The third time I bit seat a horse is if a horse already has an existing malocclusion and they are prone to developing hooks and ramps. I bit seat those horses because then I'm going to reduce the formation of the hook or ramp because I'm removing a little bit more tooth. What's most important is how you bit seat a horse. I have seen people take as much as 25% of the occlusal surface of the tooth. That is absolutely inappropriate. They make it look like a ski jump. When you do that, you're accelerating wear of the entire tooth because you're removing occlusal surface. And remember when we talked about floating teeth, we said we don't want to touch the occlusal surface. It's irregular for a reason, and if we remove it, then we accelerate the wear and the tooth will wear out faster. If you excessively bit seat a horse, you will accelerate wear. Secondly, if you excessively bit seat a horse, you can again damage that pulp horn. That can cause the tooth to get infected. If the tooth gets infected, eventually I end up removing it. So when I bit seat a horse, I go back to the idea of my finger. So rather than hold, looking at my finger from this orientation, the way I did when I was floating a horse's te te uh, lower teeth, I look at it from this orientation. It's smoothly rounded from side to side, and it's smoothly rounded from top to bottom. If you can't see my finger and appreciate it, think of a marble. I want the surface of this tooth to be smoothly rounded side to side and smoothly rounded top to bottom. So what that does is it gives, it, it has several potential benefits. One is sometimes you will see that there's this little pillow of soft tissue right here. And sometimes that little pillow of soft tissue will sneak up between the bit and the tooth and it'll get compressed and it'll cause pain. The bit seat gives that little pillow some place to go. The other thing that is proposed to happen with a bit seat is it allows the bit to smoothly move between the bars, depending on what position the horse's head is in. Now, there are some people that theorize that a well done bit seat will, remove, will allow the bit to move between the teeth. That's not where the bit belongs. It should not move between the teeth under any circumstance. So removing enough tooth to allow that to happen, in my opinion, is absolutely incorrect. I'd add bit. right there, um, Dr. McCauley, um, based off of horsemanship training techniques and uh, a couple of different training theories, I would echo what you just said. A properly placed bit and a properly trained horseman that's using a bit in the proper way um, when it's fitted to the horse correctly should not if everything is correct, should not ever touch those teeth. Um, exactly. Especially if the horse has proper dental care to begin with. It, it, there's other issues if it's not, if they don't have proper, proper dental care and they have large um, issues already in their mouth. But if everything else is correct, a, a bit should never actually touch those teeth so that it shouldn't be creating a problem. I, I completely agree. And that's, that's part of the reason that I don't advocate doing a bit seat because it shouldn't contact the teeth. It, uh, so uh, I, I don't routinely do them except under those circumstances that I describe. And there's, there's, no, there's no real evidence that suggests that a bit seat um, actually has any benefit in a horse that is properly fitted to the bit and has normal dentition. It, it, you know, um, but like I said, if, if people ask for them, that I will do them, but I do them a very specific way. And that way I don't affect the, the function of the horse's teeth and I don't 
potentially cause a problem such as an open pole pouring and an affected tooth. I completely agree with that. That mentality is, I, I don't think horses really benefit from bit seats, but that's, that's my opinion. Um, the other controversial thing that we talk about is this idea of incisor reduction. Um, several years ago, it was in vogue to reduce the incisors. So what people would do is even on normal incisors, they would come in here and they would shorten them. Um, the problem with shortening incisors is, again, you accelerate the wear of the incisor and the incisor actually keeps the cheek teeth from being in contact all the time. I asked my dentist because I fractured a molar tooth and I fractured the molar tooth because I was clenching. My dentist told me in humans, our teeth are only in contact about eight minutes out of the entire day. And that essentially should be the time that we're chewing. The incisors keep the cheek teeth apart and the same thing happens in horses. So if I reduce the incisors, if I cut them off, what happens is the cheek teeth come into contact with, them, with each other. And what happens is, is the horse gets TMJ pain. So when you talk to people who have TMJ pain, oftentimes they grind their teeth or their clenchers. If I take away the horse's incisor, bring their cheek teeth into apposition, I create a situation where I'm probably going to cause TMJ pain. So we've moved away from incisor reduction. What we should think about though is incisor leveling. I think of incisors as the window to the mouth. An incisor arcade, and I don't know why I didn't put a, a normal in here, but I think most of us would understand what a normal incisor arcade should look like. They should be completely level. You should have a perfectly straight horizontal line here when you're looking at incisors. When I see abnormalities like this, or this smile configuration here, or if we turn this upside down and made it a frown, or in this, um, this diagonal bite, this is not a primary incisor problem. This is a symptom of a problem in the back of the mouth and the incisors are wearing abnormally. So for instance, if I have those large hooks or ramps, what happens is, is the mandible can't move forward in relation to the maxilla. It's stuck in that position. So what starts to happen is, is my incisors are not in proper occlusion. So they start to overgrow the central incisor and wear excessively the corner incisor. So I'll get this smile configuration here. 99 chances out of 100, when you see this, this horse has large hooks or ramps. Okay, this is a horse that actually has that classic parrot mouth. When they have this, yes, this is a cosmetic issue, but because, not just because of this, but because the maxilla is, normal, is abnormally long in comparison to the mandible, there is a malalignment of those two structures. So I'm going to have abnormal dental wear in the back of the horse's mouth. So this Seeing these things tells me I need to be more careful about my examination inside the horse's mouth. So if you come and you just correct this problem without correcting what's happening with the cheek teeth, you're not really doing anything for the horse. You're just making them look better, but you're not actually correcting the underlying disease. So once I've identified that there's a problem by looking at and doing my oral examination and correcting the problem with the cheek teeth, then I can level the incisor because it will have an impact on how the cheek teeth wear. There are a variety of different ways to level incisors. This is a cutting wheel where they're actually cutting the incisor. This, unfortunately, is an example of incisor reduction. There's nothing wrong with these incisors. There's no reason to be cutting any tooth away there. This is a Dremel tool. A Dremel tool um, is going to take incisor away from the occlusal surface of the incisor. That is a uh, appropriate way to remove the uh, incisors if necessary. You can use hand floats. Hand floats is what my preference is. And this is just a special speculum that holds the incisors open so that you can actually gain access to the occlusal surface of the incisor. When I level an incisor, what I'm trying to do is return the incisor back to that horizontal bite that we talked about before. 
So for instance, this black line in this image estimates where that incisor arcade should line up. You'll notice that these teeth are excessively long, okay? And these teeth are excessively long. So what I'm gonna do to level these incisors is I'm just gonna remove tooth from here, and I'm just gonna remove tooth from here, and I'm gonna leave everything else alone. I'm not gonna take any of this tooth, any of this tooth, or any of these teeth, because these teeth are actually being worn excessively. All I wanna do is take away the excessively worn tooth, or excuse me, excessively erupted tooth. This is, um, again, a diagonal bite. I'm gonna use the same thought process to correct this diagonal bite. So here is where my incisors should be in contact. This tooth is excessively long. These teeth are excessively long. So when I come in here with a float, move this, I'm gonna remove this, and I'm gonna leave this and this alone because these teeth are overworn and we don't wanna take any more of those teeth. Again, this is a stage reduction. This didn't happen overnight. So I'm gonna take no more than two or three millimeters. When I take the tooth, I'm gonna take the tooth from the occlusal surface. This is the occlusal surface of the incisor. I'm gonna remove just the occlusal surface. I don't wanna take the, this is called the labial surface. I don't wanna narrow the tooth. I don't want the tooth. I wanna shorten the excessively long teeth. So I'm gonna take, from the occlusal surface. And it may, it may take multiple treatments in order to return that tooth back to its normal occlusal angle. And sometimes you can't completely re, um, correct them. And I tell people that all the time. I'm gonna do the best job that I can and get them as close as I can, but sometimes the dental disease is too severe and it's, it's an ongoing process. So I may not be able to return that tooth um, to, the, uh, to a perfectly horizontal bite. Usually, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on both the cheek teeth as well as the incisors at the same time. So it's not like you need to bring the horse back at three months for me to work on the cheek teeth and then three months for me to work on the incisors. They come back at three to six month intervals for me to work at both. So in this case, I'm leveling the incisors and I'm not um, reducing the incisors. So those are the things that I do on, um, or that I look for on an average routine dentistry in a horse. Once, I'm com once I've completed the dentistry, then I typically send clients home with a discharge instruction that has some specific recommendations. My specific recommendations are based on the horse's age. And there are several reasons for that. I basically break horses up into three primary age groups. Now, you can argue my age groups. Other people may have six age groups. Some people may have two age groups. It, it's subjective. My age groups are foals and juveniles, adults, and geriatrics. And the reason that I divide them that way is because of several things. First off, foals and juveniles, in my opinion, are horses from zero to seven years of age. And seven sounds like an adult horse, but here's my um, um, reasoning for this. First off, tooth eruption is taking place in foals and juveniles. We said in young foals and babies, they're erupting their incisors. They erupt, they may be born with their central incisors erupted. They usually erupt their, um, their middle incisors at about two weeks and their corner incisors anywhere from three to six months. So there's tooth eruption taking place as soon as they're born. Then as we go through that horse's life, we start erupting incisors. Everybody knows two and a half, three and a half, four and a half. That's the age that permanent incisors erupt. The first molar erupts at a year. The last premolar erupts at almost four years. The canine erupts sometimes as late as six years. So we have tooth eruption taking place as long as in some instances, six years of age. So I consider that a juvenile. Congenital defects. I want to examine those horses more frequently because if I identify a congenital defect, such as a parrot mouth, I have a better chance of correcting that defect before it becomes a problem if I identify it early. There are tumors of dental origin. Tumors of dental origin don't occur in old horses. They occur in young horses. Um, 
And then the other thing that people don't realize is enamel. Enamel is very similar to bone. Both, both enamel and bone have a component of it that's called hydroxyapatite. And what hydroxyapatite does is it binds calcium and it makes that structure rigid. Enamel has much more hydroxyapatite than bone does, so enamel is more rigid. But it takes time for that hydroxyapatite to, to um, accumulate in the enamel, so the enamel actually changes over time. So not only, we said that sharp enamel points come from that continuous grinding and wearing process. Well, as soon as those teeth come together, that process starts taking place. So in that day old foal that has three deciduous precursor, premolars, sharp enamel points are forming day one. Because the enamel is softer in a young horse, those sharp enamel points wear, uh, occur faster and they reoccur faster when you take them away. So it is a huge misconception to believe that young horses don't need routine dental care. Young horses actually need more frequent dental care to make them healthy adult horses from a dental perspective. So what I recommend on horses from birth to seven years of age is exam every six months. I have colleagues that actually recommend it every three months, but I think every six months is adequate. That doesn't necessarily mean that we float the horse's teeth every six months. We are examining the horse's teeth and we are addressing whatever problems that are there. If we get to adulthood, then the most common thing that we're going to do in adults is float their teeth. I, I, I'm sorry I stole this slide from another talk that I gave. An odontophyte is a sharp enamel point. That is a fancy word for a sharp enamel point. Our primary focus on adult horses is removing those sharp enamel points. The enamel is formed, it's as hard as it's ever gonna be. So unless the horses had some trauma or there was some abnormality when they were younger, typically annual exam is enough. Now, if we float the horse's teeth correctly, we may not need to do very much work in the horse's mouth, but we wanna make sure, hey, does this horse have a fracture anywhere? Hey, is there a sharp enamel point that we missed? Were we unable to get the entire cingulate gone the last time we floated the horse's teeth? So it's kind of touch up work for that horse's adult life. I consider adults to be seven to 15 years of age. Now, geriatric horses, I consider to be older than 15. And this is where a lot of people take offense. There are a lot of horses older than 15 that are very successful PRCA horses that are going to the national finals every year. There are a lot of um, uh, Olympic level dressage horses that are older than 15 that are still jumping five foot and higher. It's not that the horse is a geriatric from a life perspective. Sound, healthy, and doing well. But what happens is, is the teeth change as the horse ages. And those changes predispose the horse to a variety of different problems. Remember we talked about periodontal disease in horses. Periodontal disease, again, we see a significant elevation in the incidence of periodontal disease in horses after 15 years of age. Periodontal disease is the primary thing that we treat and manage in older horses. And in horses, up to 60% of horses older than 15 have some degree of periodontal disease. That's why I use 15 as my break. Horse isn't geriatric from a performance standpoint, but from a dental standpoint, they are. Dental attrition, we start seeing horses losing teeth um, after 15, whether it be from trauma or simply the horse is wearing its teeth out. We see, we see um, a lot of tooth loss in horses older than 15. And then this condition that's becoming more widespread, equine odontal clastic tooth resorption and hypersemantosis, it's a form of periodontal disease that affects the incisors we start seeing that condition in horses that are older than 15. And that's an incredibly painful uh, uh, condition that needs um, significant um, intervention. So I go from annual exam in an adult horse back to semi-annual exam in a horse that's 15 years of age. And I put that directly on my discharge instruction and I try to explain why and what I'm looking for in those horses in all these different age groups. Some other general um, recommendations that I make is unlimited grazing. 
if I can get clients to turn those horses out, even for the day, um, or sometimes we turn them out at night, I want those horses to have as much time grazing as possible. And the reason is, is the same reason I talked about in the horses that are on the plains in the wild a hundred or a thousand years ago. Their head is down, they're chewing with the head down, they pick their head up to look for their friends, they're chewing when their head is up, they're more evenly moving that, um, are, are uh, wearing that um, mandible and maxilla. That's also why I recommend that you feed your hay and your grain at ground level. Now I'm not saying put it on the ground. You shouldn't put it on the ground because the horse is gonna pick up particulate matter when they're eating. Um, uh, when I was in private practice, I was in Texas in private practice. We had a lot of sand. We saw a lot of sand colics. I actually had clients that would put mats down in their pastures and put stakes in their mats to hold their mats in place and then put their feeders on the mats and they would literally go out every day with a broom twice a day and swipe the, the sand off. That way their horses weren't ingesting sand. Any kind of large feeder, whether it's these 15 gallon tubs that you get in tractor supply. This is just a funny example of somebody using a tractor tire. Anything that you can put down that the horse isn't going to tump over or flip over that you can put both their hay and their grain in so that they're eating at ground level. I do this in the stall. I recommend it in the stall. I don't recommend hay nets. I don't recommend hay racks in the stall. I still put these feeders in the stall so even when the horse is in the stall they're still getting that even wear of the mandible and maxilla because they're having to eat off the ground, pick their head up, wear their arcades evenly, but I don't put the feed directly on the ground. Um, and then finally, minimizing grain and maximizing roughage. And this is always a difficult thing to do. I come from a, um, a I don't want to call it a jaded background, but I come from a farm and ranch background. Um, we didn't have pets. We didn't have companion animals. We had working cow horses and they worked every day. And our horses ate grass and alfalfa hay, no grain, and in the fall and winter, we turned them out on mixed um, grass pastures that were composed of rye, wheat, and oats because those, um, those different grasses come up and mature at different times of the year. So we didn't feed any grain and our horses were ridden every single solitary day and they were ridden for work and they were ridden hard every single solitary day. We maintained their, <clears throat> their, their um, uh, dentistry and we practiced good health practices and we never had to feed those horses grain. I understand why, horse, why people feed grain. I just don't think it should be the primary source of the horse's diet. I usually use a rule of thumb of 20% of the horse's body weight as um, uh, what their daily intake should be. So on an average thousand pound horse, that's gonna be about 20 pounds of feed per day. And I try to keep that to about 20, that of that 20, of that 2% of their body weight, I try to keep it uh, to 20 to 25 percent of grain. So that's four to six pounds of grain. So a scoop and a half to two scoops of grain per day. And then the rest of that should be roughage. And, and I, I think that maintains the health of the horse and maintains the health of the horse's mouth um, the best. So that's typically what my recommendations are for horses. So um, that kind of completes everything that I had to talk about today. Um, I don't know. Thank uh, Neely, you. if you have any questions. I uh, do actually. Um, so a couple, but the sure. start off, one of the people in our Louisiana Master Horseman class asked if you have any comment about horses being in balance. So both skeletal and musculature being in balance before you address their dental work. Um, That's a good question. Uh, I'm trying to think of how to formulate my answer. So um, I, I think that if I'm not mistaken, what they're talking about is more of a chiropractic type issue. Would you well, agree I think this person that? Or, or, in, like looking at the whole animal instead of looking at individual parts of the animal and how they all kind of interconnect. So I know specifically she's probably talking about making sure that their hooves are taken care of properly, making sure that their musculature is, you know, if, if they don't have some muscle issue that's related to chiropractic work as well as just their overall frame. Sometimes I feel like people just look at say, oh, it's their dental work. And I think she's trying to look at it from a holistic, like whole animal. And, and I, think, I think we always should look at it from a holistic standpoint. I don't, as part of my examination, I'm not going to use, say, uh, a muscular asymmetry in the pelvis 
as something that directs me towards the mouth, nor am I going to use, say, muscle atrophy of the masseter muscles to look for lameness. I think those are two separate things. I do think we need to look at the horse holistically. When I, when I am looking at a horse for performance issues, I'm going to look at both. Um, I'm going to examine the horse's mouth, and then I'm going to do a lameness exam on the horse. But I treat them as two separate, separate issues. I don't necessarily think that dental issues are um, uh, a source of muscular imbalance for the rest of the horse. So you're not going to recommend if there's an issue going on that a client, say, takes their horse to a chiropractor and a massage therapist and it's farrier before it comes to see you? No, I'm not. Uh, I will tell you that chiropractics, um, uh, massage, those types of things, those are, um, they are difficult to measure their benefit of, first off. Um, I'm probably going to say something that's going to end up being really controversial, and I apologize up front, but let's, let's take the lame horse, for instance. A chiropractor in and of themselves are not going to resolve a lameness in a horse that is truly lame. If that horse is lame because they have arthritis in their hocks, or if that horse is lame because they have navicular syndrome, or because they have, it's a young horse and he has a developmental disease or developmental problem, a chiropractor is not going to resolve that issue. That issue needs to be diagnosed and appropriately treated. And then chiropractics and massage therapy can enhance what we do medically. Okay. The problem is, is that we can't measure the benefits. There are, there are very little negative effects from things like um, well, I can't even think of any negative effects from chiropractics or from massage therapy. And trust me, I'm an older athlete. I run a lot and I appreciate my massage therapist a lot. She makes me feel a ton better and she does improve my performance. But in and of itself, those things aren't going to um, resolve the horse's underlying problem. If, if that horse has a lameness, that lameness needs to be diagnosed and it needs to be properly treated, whether that's through uh, joint injections or the administration of Adequan or some surgical procedure, then we add chiropractics and massage therapy and ultrasound therapy and laser therapy as additional therapeutics that give us some improvement that I can't measure. I, I, I don't discourage those things. I just tell you diagnose the problem first and then we add those as additional treatments. So we're going to use, we're going to look at the whole horse and say, let's take care of him the best we can by making sure everything's in balance, but we're not Absolutely. going to necessarily look at his teeth and say, oh, his hip is out or, oh, his hip is out. There must be a tooth problem. No, we, I, I do not do that. But I do look at the whole horse, especially when I'm dealing with horses. I see a lot of horses that come in for routine dental care. That's one issue. And then the next issue is, is what about that horse that is not performing up to expectations? I'm going to look at the entire horse. I'm not just going to say, oh, it's, it's got to be his mouth. I'm going to look in his mouth. I'm going to correct any problems that he has. And then I'm going to do a lameness exam on him. And I'm going to correct any problems that he has as a lameness. Um, so, you know, we, we look at the whole horse. Great. So the next question I have for you is kind of um, a personal one, right? Um, I have been fortunate or unfortunate in my life that I spend a lot of time um, managing geriatric courses. Um, and I'm not talking about that 15 year old, I'm talking about that 25 to 37 year old. Oh, horses, yeah. um, so as we age, as these horses age, um, do you think that we can, um, you know, we realize that the, the, some of these horses that I'm actually managing right now, their teeth have actually stopped growing. They're no longer erupting any tooth. So, um, the veterinarian that I'm working with has gone to the standpoint of let's look at the mouth, but we're probably not going to do anything with it because it's no longer erupting. We're just trying to maintain the gingiva and everything else around it and that health, but we're not necessarily going to have anything that we have to go and float or level, maybe some incisor work, but anything from the back end, there's really not a whole lot that they can do at that point. Are we on the right track there? Okay, so that's a really good question, and it's a really important question when it comes to aged horses. So what happens with aged horses is the teeth start to expire, and they expire at it in a predictable way. So for instance, I think I mentioned that the first molar is the first cheek tooth, permanent first molar is the first cheek tooth to erupt. That means it's also the first cheek tooth to expire because it's the oldest. 
all the molars are typically going to expire first. If we, if we compare the first molar to the last premolar, those two teeth are side by side. The first molar erupts at a year. The last premolar erupts at almost four years. So that means that that first molar has been in wear and functioning for upwards of three years longer. So even though that tooth isn't still erupting, that last premolar still is. So you have to look at it based on what age the individual tooth is. So in some instances, you may reduce an individual tooth as opposed to float the whole arcade. So that's one thing. Sometimes we don't do anything at all. Sometimes, he, that's absolutely true. At some point, they all stop erupting. The only thing holding teeth in are a, a short root that isn't very strong. Um, and in those teeth, the only thing I will do is I will palpate them. If there's something sharp, I will remove what's sharp. Um, and then I'll leave the tooth alone. Sometimes those horses, when they're old like that, they still have some occlusion between the teeth. So the teeth are still functioning, just not the way they were 10 years before. And if you float them, you take them out of occlusion and then the horse can't, can't use them. And then you look at the teeth that are still erupting and you float, maybe reduce the teeth that are still erupting. Because oftentimes, even though we expect them to be lost at a, in a certain way, what's interesting is usually it happens very predictably. They lose the first molar, the second molar, and the third molar in sequence. But some horses will lose the first molar, and then they'll lose the lower first premolar. Why is that? I have no idea why. And then they come back and lose the second molar. So when that happens, then there's, there's not a tooth for the opposing tooth to wear on, and you have to reduce it. So you just have to look at each individual tooth to make that determination. Right, and I think that was, um, my point is speaking to the fact that a lot of people, you've already mentioned this, but a lot of people um, think that, oh, I'm no longer competing on this horse. He's a pasture horse. He's retired or he's just a companion animal. I'll get, yeah, I don't really need to do anything to his teeth. It doesn't really matter. Um, and on the contrary, they almost revert back to that um, stage where they're young and their teeth are growing. And I would almost uh, wager to say that it's more important to take care of your senior horse's dentition almost as much as it is your young horse's dentition, and especially if you're trying to talk about the longevity of the animal. Yeah, Don't that's why I'm, quickly, then it's okay, but <laughs> yeah, that, that's why I uh, recommend twice a year exam. The other thing that we'll do on these older horses sometimes when their teeth are no longer erupting is we will actually, in this case, reduce their incisors because it brings the teeth back into closer apposition and they'll grind more effectively with what they have left. Now, that's an end stage process. Um, you know, right. that's going to buy you two or three more years of function from those teeth until they're completely gone. Right. The other thing that to me is most important in old horses is pain. Periodontal disease is, um, it, it gets worse as the horse gets older. When they're losing teeth, what happens is the teeth get loose and food material starts getting around the tooth and the gum gets infected. And of all the things that I have seen horses with jaws that were fractured that never stopped eating. You'd think their, their jaw looked like a bag of ground glass and they continue to eat. But you take an old horse and give him severe periodontal disease and he won't eat. That condition is incredibly painful. And for me, when it comes to older horses, that is the number one reason to examine them twice a year because they're gonna, they're gonna have loose teeth. Sometimes we extract loose teeth because they're loose they're moving around, they're packing food around them, and they're getting periodontal disease, and it's better just to get the tooth out. And then eventually, we also wanna recognize when it's time to make the dietary changes that we need to make. I have had horses that are geriatric horses that I've taken care of for years that we've gone from feeding just like any other normal horse. Um, I had a horse that stands out in my mind. These clients are awesome. They had a horse that, um, um, when he was about 26, they, um, we told him, look, this horse isn't gonna be able to eat normal hay anymore. So what they did is they went out and bought a wood chipper and they ran their hay through the wood chipper and it cut the hay into lengths about two or three inches and they fed him that for like two years and he did great. 
And then we went from there to feeding him a mash. And um, now the horse eats nothing but mash. And at some, you, you got to recognize when to make those changes. So when you start soaking your hay, so it's easier for them to, um, uh, to chew. When do you go to something like hydration hay? Um, when do you go to just a strictly mashed diet? And I have, I've had horses that have lived for years on equine senior mashes and no, no roughage whatsoever. So you're exactly right. Just because the horse is old, just because they're not erupting tooth anymore doesn't mean, mean they, they um, shouldn't be examined. The, the thought used to be that tumors were rare. That's not the case. They are common. I see six or eight horses a year that have dental tumors. And the reason I see six or eight horses a year now is because they're living to be 30, where we wouldn't have seen that before. So um, they actually need to be seen more frequently. Fantastic. I'm going to check one more time and make sure we don't have any more questions. But I think. That's gonna do it. I Perfect. think one of the things that people need to remember is, you know, just feeding your horse properly, maintaining their vaccinations is not enough, right? Like you have to do all of the things to maintain your horse in a healthy manner. And that includes looking at his teeth, looking at his feet, looking at his feed, looking at the way you deworm them. Um, like we said before, we wanna look at the whole horse. And if you're willing to spend the money on things like massage and chiropractic work and uh, all these extra supplements that horse people like to give their horses, um, you really should be going back to the basics and making sure that dental care is included. Um, I know personally, it's one of those things that since it's only once a year or every six months, it's something that's like, wait, I did that last year. And then you actually look at the calendar and it's been 18 months since you've had it done. But um, it really needs to be uh, on the forefront of our minds when we're talking about keeping our horses healthy and um, increasing their longevity in any type of career, whether it's a performance career or just being a passion horse. So. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Owner compliance makes all the difference in the world. I, I, some of my greatest successes have not been my successes. They have been the success of the client following up, doing you know the things that needed to get done. Um, when you look at things like, you know, uh, if, you, if you wanna take examples away from dentistry, if you look at things like bowed tendons, you know why horses successfully re re recover from bowed tendons and go back to um, athletic soundness? It's because the owner did the work at home. Mm -hmm. I diagnosed the problem, I made the recommendation, but the owners did the work at home. And, and so, I mean, all that's incredibly true. Well, thank you so much for visiting with us and letting us use Good. your Zoom link today. Um, this was a fantastic presentation. Lots of information was learned and, and dispelled for sure. Um, for any of you who have any further questions that weren't answered today because you weren't able to join us or you just weren't able to make it, um, go ahead and email me at nwalker at agcenter.lsu.edu. And if I can't answer them or find you the resources, I'll make sure to get in touch with Dr. McCauley and I'm sure he'll be happy to give you the answer that you're looking for, um, or the right answer, maybe not the answer you're looking for, but <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you again, Dr. McCauley. Thank you Absolutely. everybody for joining us today and we'll talk to you next time. All right. Thanks a lot, Neely. Thanks. Bye. See you later.